Hello and welcome. Uh, here we are in lecture four. So as you can see from the title slide, today we're we'll talking about sequential circuits, in particular registers and how we can incorporate them into our design. And we'll also be covering a few other little kind of housekeeping details to make sure we're kind of all on the same page. And as I said before, uh, we encourage you to play around these lecture slides while you're watching on the Jupyter notebooks you've already put to the class repo. If you want to go ahead and either download those locally or run them in the course provided uh, Jupyter environment or even run them on Binder online. Uh, the Binder service we provide is a way for people, those beyond the Santa Cruz community, easily get access to stuff. Uh, as perhaps maybe some have already discovered, those Binder instances are ephemeral and they have a pretty short timeout. So be sure to go ahead and maybe save and download your files if you're worried about it timing out on you. You can upload them back on to restore your progress. Okay, so to continue with today's uh, material, as I said, so today's going to be about registers, right? We talked so far only about combinational circuits. So after today, we'll of course talk about registers. We'll save MEMS for, for Wednesday, memories just say, full term. But even with that, we can do some cool things like building state machines. Um, and say we're also going to cover some little details like how do we do simulation and printing and that sort of thing. Okay, so, uh, you know, as always, we're going to go ahead and load things into our notebook. So this is hopefully complete pretty quickly. Um, Oh, there it is, you know, once again, double checking all the stuff. Uh, great, let's continue. So, uh, registers in Chisel uh, aren't anything too special, right? Uh, we just declared them as another object, right? So it's, in particular, it's a reg. Um, it's just another object in that design graph we're building, right? Remember our Chisel designs are really just valid Scala programs where we happen to, uh, you know, see the execution of our program construct a, you know, design as a, you know, a graph of chisel objects, which the side effect of that can be that there's a design that got created, right? And so um, a register is just another component, right? You have logic gates, you have adders, register. It's just another component, right? It's a little bit different than Verilog, where the typical mode people design Verilog is they often, uh, and this is where it's confusing, they use the exact same keyword, reg, <laughs> but it's a little bit different, right? Because in Verilog, remember, uh, a reg has certain semantics about when it's evaluated and when it's updated, but despite the name being reg, it doesn't actually necessarily require it to be a register, right? This is a, a key point of confusion with mutual teaching very long students is that um, register has certain semantics and, and when we actually use that for design, you know, there's certain ways you may have been taught how to use an always block, for example, in Verilog, that a register is inferred or synthesized by design tools. But that's actually not something that's too easy to control. And so as a consequence, both in introductory courses in Verilog, like we do here at Santa Cruz in our CC100 course, we actually encourage students to explicitly instantiate register, in our case from the Xilinx design libraries, and that way it's, it's uh, very clear you're getting a register, right? So that's mode of operation is actually very similar to doing chisel where you're gonna explicitly instantiate a register very deliberately. Uh, this actually is also common in the industry for very advanced, highly tuned designs, right? Where to have maximum portability, maybe use the Verilog reg keyword. However, to have a really optimized design where you, you know you have this library of, you know, highly tuned, optimized register cells, you want to use the right register cell for the right situation. In industry as well, you may also uh, use a specific uh, register cell. Um, this is once again kind of showing the difference between Verilog and like Chisel, it's not just, you know, some of the parameterizability I'm talking about, but also remember that for a brief history lesson, Verilog was originally produced for simulation only. Uh, synthesizing hardware designs from Verilog, logic synthesis, was actually developed after Verilog was created, right? So that's part of why something still so goofy in that language is that it was made to simulate. It wasn't actually made to make hardware. It was made to model hardware, and then they figured out how to infer that, right? And so Chisel's a hardware construction language, where as I said, you're kind of connecting these components together, and you're saying these are components, and here they are how to connect it. And so, as I said, reg is just another block. So for today, I've included a little schematic of kind of showing functionally how various fields might work together in register. Uh, however, you know, you should realize under the hood that this isn't necessarily how it's embedded inside the Verilog output, nor necessarily how it's implemented by the actual design library, right? When you actually run this through proper CAD tools and gets, you know, mapped to an FPGA or an ASIC, it may use different pre-built intrinsics, maybe a little different. But semantically, what are we talking about? We're talking about a register where, you know, okay, it has an input and output. It's a positive edge synchronous register. Uh, and well, what do we have? Well, we have a reset option where if reset is true, we load a preset value into the register, and this overrides everything else. You can see in this little schematic, I put that mux last, right? So this is the, has the highest precedence, right? So if you're saying reset, uh, that wins. Also worth noting 
this reset is synchronous, right? The way I have it drawn for mux for having some special port here, it's a synchronous reset. If you need a synchronous reset, there is a way to do that, uh, but that's not uh, what this, kit, this particular thing I'm showing right now. Um, likewise, perhaps you don't always want register update. Maybe you only want register update when an enable signal is high. If that's the case, uh, there's an enable signal. And so that, you know, if the enable signal is one, you want to take a new value. Otherwise, you are looping back the old values. Like I said, so this is a little schematic that's kind of showing you functionally how to behave in the conversation in the next few slides. Um, but you realize, of course, under hood, it may not be quite this way. So when it comes to how this works in Chisel, try and keep things both simple as well as correct. Uh, clock and reset are actually implicit. So we're actually disinstantiate just the register. And it's going to be connected to clock and reset. Now, uh, you can choose which register you want. We'll show you a few flavors in the next slide. And they may or may not have some of these other features, but clock and reset are automatically plugged in. Now, of course, there are a few times where maybe you want, as I said, maybe you want a uh, asynchronously reset register, or perhaps you want a register that has, works on a different reset signal, or perhaps you want a register that's on a different clock. Uh, those can be covered. It's just not with these techniques. Basically, what you can do is there's functionality you can look up, use what's called multiple clock domains or multiple resets, and you can annotate your design in a way to indicate you want this block to be treated differently. But by default, everything works on the same clock and reset, and this is really, really helpful. Uh, it's a lot of boilerplate that's kind of stripped away. So, uh, maybe let's go ahead and maybe see uh, an example, right? So, there's a, you know, I said there's multiple flavors of reg. So, the simplest is just to say reg and then a type, like, like we have right here. Uh, so, I've kind of made a little tiny uh, place to play around registers here. And so, yeah, so here we declare register. We just say it's of type bool, a single bit. And, you know, we, we connect both this input and this output, right? So, we connect this input to be uh, io to n. So, remember the kind of semantics connect statement here is that you know, we take uh, the output of this and touch its input of this, right? That's what's kind of what this is doing, right? So then it's connecting the input for register. This is connecting the output of the register to the IO output, right? So we can go ahead and run this and see the Verilog for it. So I'm going to warn you there's a lot of junk in the Verilog. It's not actually junk. It's just stuff that's not helpful today for us for instruction. Uh, so what's all the stuff down here which I'm not even looking at? This is stuff that uh, it admits to give you... Um, a good simulation environment that's very kind of robust. Uh, really what matters, of course, is the Verilog for uh, what we're dealing with. And so we didn't see this before because this is induced by the use of state in trying to make sure simulation is being responsible this way as using state in registers. But uh, notice this is what we care about right here. So um, and to give you a brief tutorial what it's doing, well, uh, for Chisel, when it's simulating, there is no notion of an X or a don't care. You may see that in their languages. Uh, it's either 0 or 1. Everything's given a finite value. And so if thing is, something is in the uninitialized, it is instead given a random value. And hopefully that can catch places where you're working on you know, uh, garbage data. Um, and so I can see all this extra Verilog here is being admitted in this little thing. That's initializing the randomness and giving people proper options to with pound defines equivalents in Verilog to control that. So that's why it's all that junk. But so for now, we're worried worry about this. So what do we see? As we said, it is a reg in Verilog, but it's not just a reg. It's you know a reg with non-blocking assignment in an always block, right? So this is kind of key you may have learned in your Verilog course of how to infer a register. Uh, but you can see what's happening, right? You know, okay, we're connecting your output directly and then we update every cycle. So this is, you know, hopefully kind of what we expect. As I mentioned, there's a few wrinkles, a few, you know, extras we can kind of upgrade these with, right? Um, so, uh, for example, you know, as I said, maybe we want to have uh, an initial value, right? So this initial value is applied upon reset. Uh, and so, and this is synchronous, right? So uh, it's going to appear after the next clock cycle. So what's that going to be? So go ahead and, you know, change what's common versus uncommented. And, you know, that's it, right? So we didn't actually say reset anywhere. It's just reginit refers to reset. So you see now that this, you know, signal clock and reset are always available in our designs. That's what's actually doing the reset, right? Um, and so, yeah, so if reset is true, we said we want to set it to, you know, zero. If we want it to be one, of course, that's, you know, it's a simple little flip. Boom. Now, oops. It got a little clever here. <laughs> you can see the logic analyzer realized, oh, wait, if you want to uh, have that behavior, you can, you can figure this out and realize, hey, guess what? Uh, if you want it to be one, well, that's almost just like, and that's exactly the same with this reset. Instead of having that mux we've described, 
it collapsed that mox into an OR gate, right? So it's actually some bit of cleverness in the chisel and fertile uh, logic processing. Uh, even if chisel couldn't figure this out on its own, a downstream CAD tool like you do your FPGA tools or your ASIC tools could figure this kind of stuff out. But um, that kind of gives you a little bit of a hint about what's going on. Cool. So, okay, that's using initial value. Um, what are wrinkles are there? Well, perhaps you want to also specify the source of its input. So we call it regnext. To go back to our prior slide, you can see the next is kind of the, the next value that registers and having your next cycles kind of coming in synchronously. So with that in mind, uh, regnext, we can kind of assign the input right away at the beginning. Um, so uh, because we're doing that, we actually can kind of make our life a lot easier. And we can just do this, right? So what, why is this so concise? Well, what we're we doing is we're saying regnext is taking in iota in for its input. Uh, and we are assigning, uh, you know, the output as register, which, you know, it's like, you know, sign a val r and put it on the other side to the output. So it's all kind of right there in one line. Now, maybe the first time we'll run this, we can run this without that. Um, and so we see, uh, yeah, it, you know, just as direct direct connection. If I put that back in, I'm saying initial value, and we have that, you know, initial be value behavior. So you know what was, you know, three-ish lines is now one-ish line. That's that's nice. And so that's already an example. So I just want to kind of point out is it's kind of this um, overloading here, right? So there's actually some overloading in the Chisel library for some of these features that kind of make things um, always there, or always not there. So for example. Uh, if you were curious about this, I've actually included some links in these slides. So if you want to look up semantics of regnext, for example, here we are in API documentation. And you can see there, there's two forms. So there is a form which takes two arguments and a form which takes one argument. So both of them take uh, next, which is the next value. And one of them also takes the initial value, right? If you want to use the reset version. This is kind of explained here in the documentation text of above. As we get further into the course, we'll cover more of the Scala syntactic details about what's going on with why this type T. To briefly answer that question right now, type T is a parameterized type. And this uh, syntax over here is describing uh, constraints on how wide that parameter type can be. Um, but let's go back to the notebook. And so you can see, OK, cool. So that's regnext. Uh, and then there's actually one more flavor, uh, which is regenable. Um, and so what reg enable offers, we kind of saw in the prior slide, is the ability to have a write enable signal, right? Some of the controls where if write enable is true, the register can change value at the next positive edge of the clock. If write enable is false, uh, it will uh, not uh, change value. Um, so, uh, let's make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so if we go to reg enable, okay, so in this case we have, you know, uh, you know, reading IO, or have initial value, and our enable. So, of course, we see a little bit deeper of a situation where, um, oops, there it is, yeah. It's a little bit cramped here, but uh, okay, what do we see? Well, okay, if we reset, reset has no precedence. So if we're resetting, we set it to zero. And you know, if IO enable is on, we're gonna set register to IO in, right? And so because of semantics of Verilog, it's actually not required for them to have the, you know, if, you know, the else case of this, because it's gonna take advantage of that by default, but, uh, I'm just showing the Verilog here, not because we're expecting no Verilog for this course, but more just to kind of show you what hardware is being generated. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause here before we do any more examples to kind of make sure we're on the same page about registers and how we might incorporate them into uh, Chisel. Okay, well, so far so good. Let's keep going. So, uh, what I'm gonna do is progress a few slides. Let's kind of show different uh, slight tweaks to our same design, right? So some of these common course themes we're gonna kind of bring up uh, in this next few minutes are things like designing for reuse and designing for readability are things we're gonna be talking about. So let's say for example, we want to build a counter. So what I mean by counter, uh, it's a block where if enable signal is true, it just counts up one at a time, one per cycle, uh, when the enable signal is true. And we have an output to kind of see what that current count is. Now, that could be pretty cool, right? Uh, okay, I'm gonna go back because there's a question already. So please, uh, yes, the question, go ahead.
Correct. Yeah, so the question was, wait, I just showed you, you know, there's multiple forms of Reginex. How does it get the right version? So yes, it's overloaded. And so it's important to kind of keep an eye on what's going on. So maybe it's even better to look at the enable example because that one uh, has, you know, more arguments, right? Because the issue is how do we present these overloaded uh, functions in a way that doesn't confuse the compiler which one you mean, right? And so the person who designed the Chisel library has it in consideration to think about how do I make this unambiguous, right? So in particular, you can see that in, this, in the case of both reg, uh, next, oops, reg next and reg enable, uh, part of our differentiating these two different versions is based on the number of arguments, right? Where you can see one takes one argument, one takes two for reg next, or in the case of reg enable, one takes two arguments and one takes three arguments. That's how they're kind of differentiating them. In terms of the type signatures internally, you can see that you know, enable signal needs to be a Boolean, either you know, taken or not taken. Uh, you know, sorry, it should be enabled or not enabled, right? Um, and then the other fields are this parameterized type, which it could actually be a bool. <laughs> uh, that, that, that would be a valid type there. Um, but that's how they're differentiating these. So for you as a user, yes, uh, as long as you know the usage you're using is one of the ones you can find these API docs, then that should be uh, totally usable uh, and should be correctly inferred by the tools. Great. And figure out the second question. Yeah, great question. So I think there's two questions there. So the first question was, um, wait, it seems like, you know, regin it maybe isn't as helpful. Does that actually get used? Yes. We'll see in just a few minutes there's a case where we would like to use regin enable, but syntactically we're going to back ourselves into a corner where we actually kind of use regin it. Uh, there's actually some times where you actually use just reg. So the reason why they're all in the library is they all have their own times when they're useful. Um, the second question was regards to, what if I had a scenario where I wanted uh, to use reg enable or I wanted that write enable, I wanted to specify the next input, you know, but I actually didn't care if it had reset and didn't want the initial value. Like, how do I handle that? Um, so uh, with that current library.api definition we just saw, uh, we actually do need to give a signal there. So if we don't give a signal for the uh, init signal, uh, it's going to, um, you know, have a compile issue if we do give it a literal, that literal is going to be hardware and synthesized. Now, if we really want to avoid that, this is one of these cases where we can go ahead and use a simpler reg construct, perhaps reg or, you know, reg next, and then add the functionality we want around it. So, for example, let's say we wanted you know, the combination of uh, next and enable, but um, no init, which actually I believe that's kind of what I'm showing. Uh, let's see what's actually available. Uh, yeah, you can do next and enable with no init. It's actually already built in. But let's say hypothetically there's some combination of things we didn't want. You could declare the register you want, and then you could go ahead and use whens wrapped around it to get the behavior you want. So you can still wrap things around and, you know, add your own muxes or whens statements to kind of get the behavior you would want. No problem. Great. Okay, so... Uh, Going forward to our, our counter example, so yes, we want to have this counter uh, module where, you know, it counts up one, uh, a one by one every cycle where enable is true. And, you know, if enable is not true, it holds the current count. Um, okay, so that's kind of a first pass. All right, so that sounds neat. So let's go ahead and make that a little bit more useful. And I'm not going to just count anything, right? We're actually going to take a parameter from the user where they're going to tell us um, what they want to count as the upper limit. Right, so maybe I'll go ahead and make this smaller in the beginning. So maybe say they want to the count up to three and you're starting at zero. Perfect. Okay, so counting from three to zero. Uh, we're gonna talk through this little code snippet in just a second, but okay, so it runs. So let's see what we did here. So using techniques we've learned so far, plus one thing on this count line I'll come to in just a second. This is a little bit of magic to get the bit with, right? I'll come back to that a little bit later. But for now, I mean, we're using things we've already covered, right? So. What's the next value we're going to want to feed into this? Well, we could use a mux. And okay, if we are below our, our, our maximum value, we just add one, right? 
And if we are at the maximum value, right, then we're gonna go ahead and reset ourselves back down to zero. Uh, and then if we want to apply an enable signal, here we are using some bare reg. Uh, what we do, well, we would, you know, have our enable signal, we have that thing coming in. And if enable is true, of course, we go to next val. And if enable is not true, we hold the old value, right? So we kind of have manually done the process of doing uh, the enable signal. And then for manually kind of doing a general reset, not just the wrapping around from the counter, we also can do reset. Notice how it's not visible here. Resets already in the scope uh, of the module. The reason why I'm casting the type here is that it's actually its own special type for resets. But here we're kind of using it explicitly and such of that. And yeah, we can set it to zero. And you know, if we're not, if reset's not true, then of course we want to give a chance for set our mux to take advantage. Okay, so we kind of mainly instantiated three muxes here, right? These two are kind of doing functionality we want to register. This one's doing kind of the application specific logic, so to speak. Um, okay, let's kind of talk about some more things about this. Okay, so I, for example, right now I wrote it kind of this particular way using contracts we've already covered and doing a basic reg. We're gonna talk about using some other regs, types of regs to make this simpler in a few minutes or next few slides. Now in terms of setting the, the bit width, um, so as I said, we kind of want to take advantage of inference when we can or other things like that. Now in this case, uh, if we were to, uh, you know, not specify the bit width, it would be really hard for the tools to infer it on its own. And even though we were, you know, adding one, it wouldn't necessarily make it that big, right? And so we actually instead of kind of, you know, how big do we need to have the bits to be to hold the largest value? So this is kind of a common pattern that kind of occurs. We want to have like a certain, you know, upper bound. Well, how many bits do we need to hold a certain number? If you go back to your knowledge and computer systems work, right? Okay, well, if I have n bits, I can hold two of the n things, right? But two dense things counting zero, right? So if I have n bits, the largest thing I can hold is two to the n minus one, right? And so with that in mind, I figure out how many bits I need. I need to add one to it and then take the log base two ceiling, you know, the, 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 the high end of it. And then that, so this has produced a number which we're now annotating as a bit width, right? So that's kind of what's going on there. And yes, it's type uint. So you might see this kind of stuff sprinkled throughout code. A lot of times you can get around this, but in this case, I kind of back myself in the corner where I didn't want the user to be required to give both a value and a width. I wanted them just to say the maximum value I wanted for up top, and then we kind of handle that internally. Um, cool, so, so this, this works, right? You know, we can kind of see some of the functionality here, right? You know, if it's resetting to, to, to zero, uh, you know, if we're less than three, we use this underscore T2. This is something that the tools kind of synthesize on their own. Okay, what's T2? Well, it's count plus one. Uh, if we're not, uh, sorry, if we are equal to that, then we, uh, you know, go back to zero. And this, of course, only applies if enable is true. If enable is not true, that's going to fail. and It's not going to change the state. So, okay, so we've, you know, made it we asked, you know, and of course, we've made this nice and parameterized. So here, for example, I chose three, which you can hold in two bits. If I chose four, right, that's gonna actually require a third bit. So let's go ahead and, you know, make this a little bit wider. You know, I can make this, you know, like 15 like I had before. And sure, that fits fine in four bits. You know, going to 16, now we're overflowing. Now we need that fifth bit to kind of hold that number. What's kind of nice about this is we don't need to make this, you know, line to power two, right? It can be like 25 or something, right? This is gonna work, oops, uh, just fine, right? So, cool. Um, you can see here the way it's emitting the uh, var logs using hex. But neat, okay, so this is one way of doing it and this just works and in terms of hardware efficiency, it's gonna be basically equivalent to what we're gonna see in the next few slides. And so now we're talking about is mostly just how can we change the way we're expressing our chisel in a way that makes it uh, more clear to us as well as more clear to future readers and perhaps easier to get right or tests and such. Okay, so let's talk about some variants. So as discussed previously, what if you use reg in it, right? So uh, now we're saying the initial value Actually, maybe I'll go back a slide and let's show what happens if I don't uh, give it a little hints about the, the width here. Well, what happens is it infers it to be a bit width of one. Um, it knows that the number zero is gonna need uh, one bits to represent zero. And so it's not gonna be able to get the rest of it right. So I could also have annotated this, I believe, and it should also be able to figure it out. Yes, it does, but um, I found it, you know, perhaps more convenient or more clear when I was writing this module to put the width annotation there, right? So in order to convey to uh, the tools that, you know, there's gonna be, need to hold this maximum size value, 
I kind of did it manually here. A lot of times, right, you have the literal by itself, and so it's kind of easy to do. But, okay, we're kind of back in a little bit of a corner here. Uh, alrighty. Um, so here we use the reg init, so we want to set ourselves to zero on reset. And so here I put that with inference uh, you know, trick in there just so that way we get that set properly. The next value still takes advantage of, you know, the same kind of application specific mux we were talking about a second ago. And, you know, we also were mainly kind of doing the enable. But this is, you know, a little bit, you know, more concise. And, you know, we're still going to get the, the same stuff internally. Um, cool. Uh, questions on these first two notations? I see a hand raised, but is that the prior hand or is that a new hand? Okay, great. Uh, oh, no problem. Okay, cool. So yeah, here we are we making a little bit cleaner of reg in it. You know, we managed to kind of remove one of those muxes. What's kind of about Pickler taking advantage of this reset and init is that, you know, reset hopefully is a pretty rare case for your circuit, right? And so, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of tuck those details away because it's kind of so rare. It's to kind of not get so cumbersome with that. Let's see what else we can do uh, trying to kind of keep tweaking the same uh, modules. Um, so we were using the explicit mux labels in the prior slide. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and use a when, right? And so with the when, we're once again kind of expressing it, but now we're kind of expressing it more behaviorally rather than so structurally, right? So, uh, you know, here, you know, we're gonna change things. So the init takes care of reset for us. So that's, that's nice. Uh, and okay, yeah, if, you know, the uh, enables on, then we're going to change the question is change to what right and well uh, i could have put a mux in here but i chose to keep going with ones and so what do i do today? well if counts less we add count plus count plus count plus one otherwise we do this right and so notice what's going on here right we actually are uh using the output or to say the input register directly right we are directly just saying it's going to be attached to this or that right so taking advantage of those one semantics to kind of take advantage of the muxes for us automatically and really it's kind of showing that. And so, yeah, this is going to produce the same uh, hardware. I don't think there's any noticeable differences. Um, some people may find the structure to this code makes it easier to read the intent. Uh, I think more often than not, like a larger modules, it's going to look closer to this style. The reason why is very often you have multiple things that are kind of uh, related, right? Where, you know, some input signal is sent. You don't just change one register. Maybe you change multiple registers or maybe multiple things happen. So it's going to be, perhaps multiple lines within these blocks and it kind of makes more sense. So it's kind of nice to kind of have that thing. And although that mux signal is very helpful, that mux construct is very helpful. And we kind of taught you that early on in this course. Um, I think, you know, more uh, experienced shows developers often find when very helpful to kind of do things and let the tools worry about, uh, you know, what needs the mux what in order to get the right semantics and the right precedence orders. Cool. Okay. I think I have one more or maybe not. Do I? We'll find out. Yes. Okay. I do have one more. And, uh, this one, you can see from the title, I suggested was perhaps too dense. So uh, what did I do? Well, uh, I did all of the stuff we've been doing so far in just one line, right? <laughs> so we can go ahead and unpack this. Uh, so let's figure out what's going on. Okay, so maybe we'll go right to left. Okay, reg enable, we understand. Uh, using enable signal from the IO. Okay, check. We got that. Uh, remember to reg enable with the three argument syntax. We can also set the init signal for reset. Uh, check, we got that. And then what I do here, I just dropped in a mux directly to do the, the wraparound, right? So uh, if we are less than max value, we add one. Otherwise, we uh, you know wrap around back to zero. Um, and so you may also notice that this is such a you know Spartan uh, implementation. We didn't even declare uh, you know a name for register, right? We're actually just a register is technically anonymous, and we're connecting it to I out that out directly. Um, we're gonna need a way to refer back to that to get the current count, and so we actually refer back to I out that out, right? So uh, I would argue that this implementation, despite being concise, is you know more confusing <laughs> and harder to understand for you know both yourself and that I was trying to read it. You can see the hardware is you know analogous. Um, so let's, let's talk about what makes this confusing, right? There's a few things going on. Number one, just from a pure complexity point of view. There's a lot going on in this line, right? So sometimes things like mux are kind of helpful constructs, but you know, putting too many things in the same line, of course, that increases complexity. Um, now, the other thing to note is that 
uh, by not even bothering to create like a, like a name for his register or anything, we, we're losing the opportunity to kind of convey the intent here, right? Uh, here we're taking advantage of IO to out already existing as a wire we can kind of attach to. On both sides, we're kind of attaching the output here and then, sorry, the input here and then the output we're using over here, right? The, the prior design, oops, oops, I didn't mean to overwrite it. Uh, if we change modes, the, the prior design, by calling it count, right, we're kind of suggesting to whoever's reading this module, yes, this is a count, right? This is some sort of number we're trying to do. And so we have a chance to kind of name something and go about it, right? So it's kind of to have that functionality versus here, you know, in our conciseness, we've saved it out, right? So I could have been just as well say, you know, val count equals reg enable and then out it out connects to it, right? Even now it would have been a big improvement. So maybe I'll go ahead and do that right now to kind of show what I'm talking about and argue why this is uh, better. So that was the original, perhaps even just a slight uh, improvement would be to, you know, say, uh, oops, val count equals this. And then uh, we're going to need to go ahead and go ahead and connect out. I, so kind of some context what's going on. Now, what we'd really want to do is put count in here, right? But the problem is that uh, it's kind of like a circular reference, right? How do we <laughs> uh, do that, right? Because how do we put count right here when we're the same line we're defining count? So I can go ahead and try that, but I'm, you know, pretty sure we're going to get a Scala error. Because, yeah, count, uh, recursive count needs a type, right? Um, and so let's kind of imagine how this is even possible. How does this even occur? Well, remember, this is what registers provide us, right? Is the registers can have feedback. You can have, if I go back a few slides, uh, you can have registers have their outputs feeding back and input like we did even right here. That's a value to register. That's a loop, but it's a loop going to register, right? And the nice part of registers is that they only change state, you know, on the clock edge, right? It's kind of that whole point why we do them. And so, you know, people often refer to this as synchronization, right? And that's the point. We're using that clock to kind of synchronize things. So, yes, there's a feedback loop, but it's at a measured rate and everything happens simultaneously. So that's why it's not going to cause problems. And so, yeah, um, to answer the question from a few minutes ago, when might I, you know, why don't I have to always use reg enable? Here's an example where, because if we want to have this, you know, feedback path, um, it's kind of hard to everything all at once. And so I argued, you know, it's going to be good to name things just so for clarity and understand what's going on. Um, additionally, uh, you know, that could be clear. Now, maybe a better fix to this, for you to keep, you know, talking about different design alternatives, maybe I should have made a better interface name, right? I should change all of them at once, uh, right? Now, maybe if I had made a better interface name, uh, we could be a little better off, sure. Uh, but then uh, I still argue this line's pretty dense, right? So it's a little bit of style, a little bit of uh, kind of feeling this out, trying different alternatives and seeing what's most readable, most correct. You can see the hardware's kind of the same. Uh, and getting correct hardware is you know, only step one, right? Trying to make sure it's readable, robust, reusable. That's kind of what we're trying to, you know, still in this course, really kind of make things that are maximally useful. Um, cool. Uh, questions on this so far? Great. Okay. Well, let's uh, keep going. So, oh, sorry. Uh, we go ahead and test this. So I, you know, have a tiny uh, situation here. Oops. And I, <laughs> as we just saw, I redefined uh, count to have a different interface. So it's going to break that test. So I'm going to go ahead and compile a different version of count, of my counter. And that should work, I think. Oops. And that'll fix it. Yep, it did. Great. So yes, it worked. Uh, this is the way we've been running tests so far. It's pretty laborious, right? You know, you poke a value, check an output, one wrinkle is now I'm talking about the step feature, right? So realize we call step not on the IO, but on clocks. Remember both clock and reset are available just in the broad scope within a module. They aren't IOs in the module, even though they get turned into IOs in the Verilog, they're actually just in the broad scope of the module. So that's why, you know, previously you may see me access reset directly or here I send clock directly. And we're saying, hey, that clock advances by one cycle. You actually can put a number in here and advance it by multiple cycles if you'd like. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's still peak and poke. Expect, like from before, this is pretty, you know, laborious way to write tests. Uh, we're going to cover, you know, things like loops <laughs> on uh, on Wednesday. But for now, you can still see kind of went through the same process. Just for fun, I can go ahead and maybe change this to um, 
you know, advanced multiple cycles, this is going to break the test, right? Because, you know, we got, we advanced by three cycles, so it saw us three rather than one, right? Um, but you, you, can, you can do that. Okay, so that's just us running it. Um, later today in the lecture, I'm going to comment this out and uncomment this, and we'll see what this can do for writing a waveform. Okay, uh, let's keep going if there's no more questions. So, uh, one handy function in the language is something called enum, right? And this is Chisel's way of doing enumerated types. So this is a function you may have seen a lot of other feature I've seen a lot of other languages. Uh, in particular, actually, even Scala itself is something called enumeration. And Chisel, you know, is the, uh, you know, more concise, you know, enum. So what does it do? Well, uh, you can see example syntax here. So here I've defined three names. And those three names are going to be assigned distinct uint values. In particular, it's going to go ascending, right? So they go uint 0, uint 1, uint 2. But they're assigned distinct uints. Uh, and these are really helpful to kind of put human readable names on things, right? So having, you know, just like you might do in C++ or some other language, having enumerated types are really helpful to kind of be clear to users as well as to yourself about that way you can have a constant to kind of keep having magic numbers remember magic numbers are, but also it's helpful to um, convey what's possible with a reasonable thing, right? So, you know, a canonical example might be using these to label states in a state machine, which we're going to do in just a minute. Uh, but other times people use these for things that are a little bit different, right? You can maybe use it to label different ways in a mux, right? You know, does somebody not remember, you know, elsewhere in a module, can I send a single user control of mux? Then you remember, oh my gosh, wait, is this on port two? What is port two? And instead it's like, you know, a lame thing. Like I want to do PC plus four, for example, in the processor, you know, they have that labeled, you know, next PC or something. It's easier to reason about. Um, and this is also helpful sometimes you have these enumerated types exposed to outside people who are using your module going into your interfaces. That would kind of say very clearly, you know, which functionality you're kind of triggering. Um, and so, yeah. So, okay, maybe it's worth me spending just a minute, thanks for the TA for a few suggestions, uh, to clarify some of the syntax here. So, uh, the uh, enum feature in Chisel is good, but there's room for improvement. So, uh, what do you have to do when you're using this? Well, what you're doing is you are manually con constructing a list here on the left, and we're just taking advantage of Scala to kind of do the unpacking for us automatically. So what you've actually done here, independent of Chisel, is you kind of <laughs> created these, uh, you know, oops, uh, created these names in the scope, and this double colon is a uh, cons, like you may see in other languages, like, like for, you know, uh, appending things. Um, so you've cons them all together, and then you've null terminated the list with a nil. So the nil is something that's kind of boilerplate. So for now, oops, I mean to keep moving this out. You treat the nil as kind of boilerplate. So for you using this feature in Chisel, you can kind of think of it just more as write the names you want separated by double colons, have a nil at the end, and then you need to put the number of how many things you need, and you get that right. If you get a number too low, then the later things may not bind. You might get some errors. If it's number too high, uh, you're just going to waste some enum space. I think it's going to be a little bit, uh, it's going to make the enums bigger than it needs to be. Uh, so you actually do need to kind of make that match up. Yes, this requires a little bit more work for the humans. Yes, that's perhaps more error prone, which is part of why uh, the language developers have a new uh, functionality uh, kind of already in beta. But for now in this course, we're recommending this. If you want to go ahead and try this other beta feature out, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so what's kind of the key things we're doing with the new one? Uh, you actually are defining objects and then you can kind of add this inside. It's pretty cool. I provide a link if you want to check out some documentation on that. Uh, it is available uh, in the language. So give it kind of a brief feature, you might see this. So some features you may find in your, your studies where it's listed under experimental. Experimental is another sub package in Chisel 3. So that means you can just, you know, Chisel 3, you know, dot experimental and import that. You can go ahead and use these. Um, the reason why it's an experimental rather than a main language feature is the, the developers of the language are kind of, you know, fine tuning certain features and are not ready to commit to maintaining an API long term. Now, for sake of this course, where we are kind of going to take one version of Chisel and version of Scala and try and use that for the entire course, that's fine, right? Because, uh, you know, if in two months they change your mind about this and there's a new version or it's removed or something, it's not going to affect you because we're going to still be using the same version of Chisel. Now, if you maybe want to make something really long-lived or you we're doing this for a multi-year project, you may be more concerned about adopting experimental features that might get removed. But for this course, where we're kind of doing just a snapshot of the current version of Chisel. Yeah, if an experimental feature seems cool to you and you like reading about it, Go for it. Um, great. All right. Uh, more questions on enum. Cool. All right. Uh, let's keep going. So uh, let's put all this together and make a state machine. 
So, you know, you may have covered this in prior courses, like, I know, a final state machine. I dreamed up a little small one over the weekend, if you know, of our own venerated critters at UC Santa Cruz, the raccoon. So you can imagine if you want to simplify the behavior of raccoon, you can kind of think it's kind of maybe four states it goes through where maybe it's initially hiding. Uh, and if there's no noise, you know, it's going to go ahead and wander and look around for things. If it comes across some trash, it's going to look for some food and rummage. And if it finds food, it's going to go ahead and eat it. And eventually, when the food is gone, if there's no more food left, it's going to go back to wandering. And at any point, it hears a noise, you know, where it's any one of these states, it's going to go back and hide, right? So that's an example uh, state machine. Okay, so let's see how this might look inside uh, Chisel. So uh, here is that, that state machine kind of encoded in Chisel. So uh, this is a very simple state machine. Uh, you know, have our inputs of, you know, noise, trash, and food. Uh, there's no output actions because the ac action itself, a state written, is kind of the action. Where I'm kind of, in this case, conflating both the action and the state, the same thing, so that's okay. So yeah, we're either hiding, wandering, rummaging, or eating. Um, and then, so what do we do? Well, we could, you know, define our um, state as just a register. And, you know, we use a reginit and we set the initial value reset to being hiding. And that's kind of our default starting state. And using the things we've learned so far in this course, we can go ahead and, you know, do things like, you know, when, okay, if we're initially in the hiding state, or sorry, when we're in the hiding state, if we don't hear a noise, we can go ahead and change to wander. Now notice, right, I didn't bother saying the else for this, right? This is not true. Let's say it's in state hide, but there is io.noise. It's not going to do anything, right? Because it's not going to reach its connection, and there's no other connection to reg in it. So there's actually no input given to reg to the reg state. So that's not going to change value, right? So this is one of those cases where those muxes are kind of saving. It's kind of very concise uh, way of expressing it. And the other logic we saw in the prior state machine, right? You know, uh, for these other states, if we hear io.noise, we retreat back to hide. And if there's not io.noise, but there's some other condition met in this case, you know, if we find trash move on to the next state, you know, if we find food, we move on to eat, and if food eventually runs out, then we go back to wander, right? And then to kind of complete this, you know, we tied state to IO to action. Now, once again, uh, from a, you know, concise point of view, we could have just as well, perhaps, you know, initially put um, IO to action directly attached to an anonymous register, but perhaps maybe making these chance to name things and make it more clear, you know, yes, this is the internal state, and yes, our internal state is being explicitly exposed via connection to action, and maybe perhaps a more reasonable thing. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, run this. Uh, it's gonna be probably a little too long to squeeze in here too well. But yeah, you can trust me, it's all there. Once again, you're kind of looking how Chisel's turning this into Verilog. Like it says, it's kind of very bite sized, like turning into small little statements. So you see, there's a lot of these muxes for whether it wants to uh, you know, advance to the next state. So it's actually turned our enumerated types into numbers, right? So zero is going to be hide, one is going to be wander, two is going to be rummage, three is going to be eat. So it's kind of our turn those, and it's kind of use cases when we advance. And then it's using the chisel ifs to, oh, sorry, the verilog ifs to do the kind of the appropriate things. Uh, you can play around on your own, but this is one way of doing it. Cool. So this is one way of doing it. Uh, as suggested by chat, you know, a bunch of, you know, if else effectively seems a little bit inefficient. So could we do a switch? And the answer is uh, yes. Yes, you can. Uh, so there's a switch construct. Um, and that's what we have here, right? So uh, switch in chisel behaves like perhaps you've seen their languages uh, where you can have a switch. So we're just switching based on the state, you know, for what, what the current state is. And then based on that, you say is, you know, instead of case, for example. And then you know what you want to do, right? So if it's hide, you know, is it wander? Is it rummage or whatever? Um, this will produce an equivalent, uh, you know, uh, design for what we just saw in the prior slide. You still see it has all these kind of, you know, anonymous gens over here, and it puts them all together. So it's not going to do anything too different. It's just perhaps maybe a more convenient way of doing it to kind of round out what the capabilities are to switch statement are. So switch, um, you know, does, uh, um, you know, allow you to do this based on a single type, uh, sorry, a single value. Uh, perhaps some languages like C, you know, maybe take advantage of the cat fact that, you know, oh, well, maybe I don't leave a break statement in there. That way I can have things fall through. There's no falling through. It's going to be, you know, just this case by itself. Um, interestingly, the reason why Chisel is able to use the name switch is it's actually not a keyword in Scala. So Scala is something called match, and it's actually a bit more general. 
and we'll come across that um, uh, in a few weeks. But so for switches, this is fine if you want to do this kind of more concisely. It's just perhaps a great way to do a state machine. And to kind of drive home the next example we were discussing a few seconds ago, if I maybe you know, made a typo, and yeah, it's going to say, oh, wait, uh, I wasn't able to, uh, you know, um, assign everything. If I make it too big, it should work. Oh, it's also going to play. I didn't get exactly right. Okay. Uh, you get exactly right. It's happy. Great. More questions on the state machine example. Okay, let's go forward to the other kind of uh, final details. Oh, sorry, one more, I forgot. We, of course, want to test our state machine. So uh, I wrote a test case out. As you can see, it's pretty long. I also was a little bit lazy, so I didn't write every single every cycle, kind of remembering which ones I need to change or not change. If you don't change a poke value, it'll stay the same across signal uh, cycles. So yes, uh, you can trust me that this um, does the right thing. There's a lot to be desired here, right? Number one, you know, Testing a state machine manually like this is very laborious, right? You can imagine, oh my gosh, I have to like imagine all the paths through everything. That can be tricky. Sometimes it's easier to have uh, your logic separated out into like a control logic versus like the register, and then you test every argument control logic with something a little more deliberate. Um, another thing that's perhaps you know less than ideal with the way I wrote this, for reasons of scoping, uh, I didn't have access to the enum uh, type. You can wrap that in the object, and we'll cover that a little bit later. And so I had to just kind of, you know, figure out or know what the state encodings were going to be. Uh, that's also not great. It's a huge chance for, you know, getting uh, something wrong when something gets changed. But, you know, using the things we've learned so far, we're kind of constantly increasing our tools, uh, to our arsenal of tools. This is what we have so far. Um, and yeah, it, it works, right? So if I, you know, change something about this, it'll break the simulation. Okay, let's go ahead and keep moving on, though. So um, we've been talking a lot about simulation. So, uh, well, how, what are we doing from this, right? So remember, with Chisel, we're describing a design, right? And then you have that design. Then it's kind of a question of what are you going to do with it, right? You can go ahead and, um, you know, pass it on to other CAD tools to get manufactured or implemented in the FPGA. Or you can simulate it, right? And so the simulation we use for all sorts of purposes, what do we want to be to know how well it's going to run, to test it, to see how it might behave, etc. And so, so far with these notebooks, and for example, we've been using these uh, testers, in particular a peak poke tester, uh, to, uh, you know, play for design, right? We're really just running tests as a form of simulation. So more broadly, uh, I said you may want to run simulation perhaps without as many, you know, explicit stimuli or expects. That's totally fine. As we go throughout the course, we're starting more long-run simulations that aren't quite so micromanaged. Um, but so when you write a simulation, the question is, how do you take useful information out of that, right? Um, and so there's kind of two main ways of information out of a simulation. Uh, one is to put in explicit print statements for things you want to capture. And the other is to collect the waveform, right? To see all the values over time. So both are possible. And so we're going to kind of cover both, right? And so, uh, you know, it's easy to get very attached to, uh, you know, um, to print statements, we know that a lot of program languages and a lot of you know people building building programming tools try to get to stop things from print statements and say use the debugger and stuff like that. Um, we kind of have similar sentiments about some of these designs where if there's certain things you want to check for, you should check for those explicitly, right? So perhaps you're designing a design, making a design very chaotically, you might you know code it up, not make a proper test case, instead just make a bare minimal test bench and just kick it off and then manage the waveform to make sure the right thing happened. Well, use a human to convince yourself that that design run on that simulation run did the right thing, but that's not really very usable, right? So at a minimum, you actually really should make a test case where you explicitly test for the value you want to see. At least that can be repeatable and rerun. Um, that being said, why do we have prints and waveforms? They're really helpful for debugging, right? So I recommend building expensive tests. If there's certain things you want to do to make sure your module's correct, don't consider yourself done until you have tests that people can run without you doing an intervention that, you know, tell you if it's right or not. But then when you want to use the print statements, you can use those kind of strategically to track certain values, right? So the waveforms, I think, are really great, especially for uh, small designs, where you can have all the stuff kind of plopped in there. Interestingly, uh, the prints actually might be more scalable than the waveforms sometimes, right? The reason why being, of course, that if you're tracking every signal for every cycle, if you have, you know, millions of cycles, uh, signals and millions or billions of cycles, 
that quickly becomes very large, right? And that simulation becomes completely bottlenecked by producing the waveform and then you make it a very large waveform file, a VCD file, maybe even terabytes, and then learn that's very hard for the tools. And so sometimes you need to kind of be a little bit more selective, right? And so by default, it is going to produce, a, if you ask it to do a waveform, it's going to produce a waveform signal for everything inside your design. There are ways to kind of tell it in advance, you know, actually I actually only care about this time period or only uh, these signals and give some sort of, you know, rule to kind of prune that down. Um, and so some of the people would like the print statements where you can have very, you're just things to kind of show you exactly the right form you want in exactly the right way. Uh, for example, the Boom processor, which is an out-of-order machine built in Chisel. Uh, the person who built this was very passionate about doing prints in a certain way. And if you had the exact right size terminal with their print statements, it all lined up. And it was almost like you had this like text visualization of your out-of-order processor state. And it was very helpful for this person to debug it. And, you know, it's actually impressive. Or well, basically one individual in a couple of years built a, you know, performant uh, out-of-order core when normally that's the work of, you know, perhaps a dozen people over many years, right? And so <laughs> that really kind of showed the productivity power of the chisel. But also this person found that getting the print image just right for the use case really helped them. And so we're going to show both, right? So let's go ahead and maybe talk about printing first. So you may have kind of seen this indirectly, but maybe making it more explicit, teaching you about the prints. So um, there's actually multiple times you can print. There's printing during the generation stage, so while your Scala program is running to create the chisel, design, chisel circuit. And then this happens during the simulation, right? So in Scala land, you know, there's this print line um, command. There's also print if you don't want the new line added at the end, but I use print line 99% of the time. Um, one thing you may not have picked up on, but it's worth highlighting, is I have a slight typo here. I'm going to go ahead and fix that right now before I forget. Uh, is it something called string interpolation? So uh, this is a feature available in other languages as well. Basically, rather than having to do uh, you know the classic printf stuff like C, instead you can start the string with the s character, and then have your string, and then uh, if you have a dollar sign, you can just put a variable name, uh, and uh, if you um, uh, want to actually evaluate an expression, not just a single variable name, you actually can put stuff in here. So I can say foo.bar, I can even say, you know, like foo.bar, you know, plus one inside this curly braces, that's totally fine. Um, so that's super, super handy um, to have that interpolation. This is available just in Scala in general, it's not a chisel thing. But for example, you might say something like, you know, oh, hey, you know, my, this generator is running with these parameters. I'm, you know, making a multiplier to this many bits wide or something. That's kind of thing to print these kind of things out. And you can also imagine, uh, you know, more sophisticated, more mature code base, perhaps uh, doesn't even use print line, perhaps uses a logging statement, which elsewhere use a logging library to kind of configure the verbosity, right? So you're perhaps on a normal run, doesn't say anything, but someone's like trying to figure out, oh my gosh, why is the design going weird? I want to turn on like a more detailed logging level. Then you can start seeing the generators talking about, okay, well, I inferred this parameter from this, this, and this. I inferred this parameter from this, this, and this. These are the kind of things I'm to put there. Now, during simulation, there's printf, right? So printf is actually a keyword, not once again in Scala. It's a keyword from Chisel we added to the language, or they created that to the language. Um, and so, uh, and as pointed out, I forgot to put interpolation thing here. Um, so you can use printf just like a C printf, basically, where you can go ahead and give it a string, followed by you know an arbitrary number of arguments that are replaced by the specifier. The specifier, of course, like a C printf tells it, you know. What goes there? Is this, you know, a integer? This, you know, uh, or is it unsigned? Is it hex or whatever? So that that works just fine. Um, some people find this really helpful because they can just kind of very densely compact in whatever they want. Other times, folks like the more interpolation style, where it's kind of nicer and uh, more verbose. Um, here, we're just taking a default number encoding. Later on, you may want to um, be more deliberate about I want hex decimal or something like that. Then you actually need to put in a syntax where you put like, you know, stuff instead of actually write a hexadecimal is kind of very long. They're, the language developers are trying to shorten that, but you still see that's kind of there. Um, so cool, yeah, that's available. I should perhaps maybe uh, change one of these two links so you can kind of see more documentation on the other types of prints you can do. Um, any other questions or comments about prints? Cool, okay, so this is printing, like I said. Uh, also, I guess mentioning, make sure we're extra clear. So technically you can use a print line during simulation in the tester module, right? Because remember the tester module, or it's not a module, it's a bit of Scala code is running 
as a Scala program while you're writing a simulation, right? So um, you can put print lines in there. Uh, the printfs are for within your module for when you're actually running a simulation. And of course, a printf is not, you can get turned into hardware. So you synthesize your design to hardware on FPGA or something else, it's not going to be there. Um, it will use the right Verilog keywords to print stuff out in the Verilog simulation, but just not, but of course, when it gets past the real CAD tool, it's going to get removed. Um, cool. And another, another bit of advice from the TA is that, uh, you know, if time is not passed, uh, printfs are invisible. So to make that more concrete, uh, chisel printfs are basically printed uh, every new positive edge, right? So if you ever call step, they're never going to appear. Yeah, so you need call step to advance time in order to cause that positive edge evaluation of when these printfs occur. Yeah, great point. Thank you. Okay, and then... Uh, one other little detail, which I didn't cover earlier, I wanted to kind of go back to my notes, make sure we kind of cross all our bases. When it comes to expressing literals, I think we've gotten pretty good at, you know, adding, uh, you know, specifiers, make it u int, s int, or bool. That's great. We talked about how to do bit whiffs. One thing I don't think I maybe mentioned explicitly was you also can use strings. So sometimes for numerical values, it's very handy to, uh, you know, write things out in hex, something like that. Um, and so the functionality is available where you can actually take a string and you give it a you know, format specifier at first, right? So you can say hex, octal, binary, et cetera. Then the, the value. And then, you know, dot u will still kind of get casted to the chisel u int. Now, uh, you also can put in underscores, right? So for big, long literals, that's very helpful. So this is kind of a nice little thing to have. Maybe writing a long binary number you want to separate your four bits. This is something to kind of have in your arsenal. Okay, so I think this is the last slide. And that's my cue to actually go back a few slides. And let's go ahead and do this waveform business. So... Uh, even inside this Jupyter environment, we actually can generate a waveform. So yeah, here we just kind of toss in this uh, annotation is called. In this case, writing VCD as in VCD is a format for a, uh, a waveform file. So, oops. Oh, no. Uh, okay. I forgot the import statement, so I have to go back and add the import back in. So that's going to need to be, oops. So excuse me, I need to go back to the beginning. Uh, this is what happens when you develop a stateful environment. Um, actually, uh, yeah. I have to actually edit. You know what? Okay, well, uh, unfortunately, I'll fix the slides before I post them tonight. Um, it's not easy for me to modify the uh, IV.sc file right now. I'll make sure this works before I post it again. However, fortunately, I did already save the result. <laughs> so uh, I believe if I go to here, uh, I can go ahead and log into our trusty server for this course. Uh, actually, I'm already logged in. And yeah, so I already ran this, already clicked the VCD file. So one waveform viewer, which is already installed on the course server, is GTK Wave. It's a nice open source one you can run on Linux. On Mac, to run on locally, is one called Scansion, which is also free. And we should be able to see that VCD file. So we'll go ahead and launch that. It launched a matter of so I'm gonna drag it down. But yeah, you know, here we have a waveform viewer. Uh, you probably come across these in other courses, right? So uh, we need to go ahead, and I'm running this remotely, so of course it'll take a little bit of time to update the uh, UI. That's gonna be fun. Um, but okay, let's go ahead and, you know, drag the visitor. Okay, maybe I want to see the clock signal, um, right? Or maybe I also want to see the enable and the output, uh, maybe also reset. So yeah, we can kind of see what's going on. Oops, we're actually fine like that. So you see that, you know, actually by default, I didn't do anything in the test bench. Uh, it's doing the reset for me at the very beginning. You see the clock is already oscillating. You see the clock actually technically starts a little bit later. That's all that weirdness we saw in the very long from before. So it's making sure the reset set before the first positive clock edge and then everything's kind of initialized, right? And we can see the value of, you know, I to out going through the multiple things. If we want to perhaps, you know, uh, change the format to hex, there we go. Uh, and that's kind of from our test bench. If you remember our test bench, which hopefully I can bring back in. Um, here we go. Yeah, we see what we did. Okay, we had enable set to one for a while. We set to zero. We stayed at three for two cycles, and then we wrapped around, right? Okay, so... Um, that's what we see here, right? We set enable to, to one, 
and it stayed there for a while. And so we had, you know, zero, one, two, three, and then, uh, you know, wrapped around by itself, back to zero and kept going. So there we have a waveform, except for you using a waveform as a way to debug things. Like I said, depending on where you're running stuff, uh, if you're running things on the server, you perhaps want to SSH in another terminal outside of Jupyter and, you know, run GTK way, which is already installed. Or if you're running things locally, you can either install GTK way or some other waveform viewer you like. VCD is a very commonly supported format. Uh, on Mac, there's actually a great free program called Scansion, which also can read VCD files and that, you know, installs and it's great. Cool. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and fix these slides before I post them, but other than that, are there more questions? Okay, I just wanted to give a brief uh, recap on the current uh, course activities to make sure everyone's on the same page. So I believe the vast majority have already, you know, filled the forum to request uh, account access and we've already uh, approved those for those that have already been submitted. There might be a few more since the last few hours. I haven't checked since then. Um, and so with that, you can log into our system and do the Jupyter Hub, especially for the labs, is really helpful. You can, you know, get the lab sent directly to your account that way. You can work on it there and you can save it and submit it there. We have an algorithm script running approximately five, 10 minutes is going to kind of pull things and run it. And so, yeah, so go ahead and submit it and then, you know, wait for me to come back and hit the fetch feedback and you can see the results. Um, and then we'll figure out a way to propagate those grades from there back to Canvas. We'll do that. Uh, but then also is the homework, right? So uh, the homework was also posted last week and uh, that's going to be due uh, this coming Thursday. And for you know, homework one, it's not super long. We're kind of still ramping up. That's you're going to use the SPT environment. SPT is this tool for running, uh, you know, larger scholar projects. I wrote a brief primer about that. It's also on the web page. So there's been some additional content added to the main course web page. We're going to keep adding content um, so that we kind of get things going. So that's kind of be the format for the next few weeks. It's kind of three lectures a week uh, with uh, lectures giving them out, you know, as notebooks. You can play around with them while we're going to lecture or afterwards, sure. Uh, there's going to be a lab, which, you know, you should do in Jupyter and submit within our and provide a course environment. And then there'll be a homework assignment, which you should do perhaps locally. If you want to do a server, you're welcome to do it there too. And then you submit that through Gradescope, which is another service, of course, you've access to from Canvas, and we'll grade those, right? This will be the next five, six weeks of this. And then we're going to shift gears and go to projects a little more open-ended, but for now, we'll be very kind of regimented with that kind of that schedule, not, you know, cadence, not methodology. Uh, and of course, there's also office hours provided by the staff. Uh, mine are on Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, Jason and T will have his office hours on Wednesdays, which I believe he's still picking a time for. Cool. Other course questions? Homework solutions. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, so uh, it, intention is the entire you know project. Uh, we'll be working with Jason to make sure um, uh, you don't submit you know unnecessary dot class files or whatever, but stuff like that. But yeah, we basically want the whole folder. Uh, and our outer grader kind of expects that and it's going to work with that for how you're going to submit the homeworks. Um, I think the other question maybe you didn't ask, but I can go ahead and answer right now about solutions. Uh, we aren't planning on posting solutions, but we definitely do want to help you get your code correct. And the reason why is not just for the learning value, but also for some of our modules we're going to be creating, we're actually going to be continuously working on the same module for a few weeks at a time, right? Because we're going to maybe make it in one homework and then in a the future homework we're going to go ahead and make it more flexible or more optimized in some way. And so uh, for that reason, we are going to try and use the auto grader to try to get quick turnaround to get back to, oh my gosh, you know, you did pass tests for 08, you passed most tests, but one little corner case. The hope or expectation is that, you know, most of the time, most students when they submit the homework will feel pretty good about it. And maybe it'll be one corner case they didn't think of that maybe gets caught, but we're, we're kind of hoping and expecting that most of the time, you know, most uh, tasks, students will be pretty comfortable with their submissions. And we're for auto grading, hoping to try and catch those few corner cases and let people know early about that. Oh my gosh, yeah, I should watch out for this corner case. They'll check that, make sure that kind of lines up. Sure. Uh, I saw a question from chat about bits. I'm not sure quite what that is. Maybe the person could clarify that for me.
Yeah, yeah. So I, I, perhaps we could have used a better name for that. It's often referred to as bit extraction. Personally, I use the word access. Uh, so um, that was briefly mentioned kind of in passing without a demo in the prior lecture. The short answer is you have the variable name and then and afterwards you put parens and then either a single number for a single bit or a number common number if you want a range. Um, and, uh, you know, it's in the, uh, that should be in Friday's slides, I'm pretty sure. Uh, not Wednesday's, unfortunately. It's kind of a little bit jumbled the order, I think, but yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and thank you folks, have a, a good day.